Today we'll be covering Throne and Liberty, the latest MMO from NCSoft, which is being published in the West by Amazon Games. After playing for over 200 hours, I can finally review the game fairly and tell you whether or not it's worth investing your time and money in, and whether it's any good. Let's get started. Starting off with the visuals, this is an absolutely gorgeous game. Everything from the environments, to the textures and animations, to the special effects from abilities and bosses looks absolutely stunning. This game is well optimized, but there are a lot of details, and it is an intense game, and you'll still want a powerful computer to run the game well. For example, running maxed settings on my computer, I get a stable 70 to 80 frames per second. This drops to 40 in big battles and 20 at siege, but that's with every special effect turned on to the max, so there's definitely some tweaking that you can do to improve performance. The game is entirely open world and powered by Unreal Engine 4. The absence of loading screens is, in my opinion, one of the game's best optimization features. If you have an SSD, you should be able to teleport around without ever having to wait on a loading screen. The character creator is comparable to other Korean MMOs, but not quite as good as Black Desert Online's. Where the character creator really falls apart for me is the lack of customization when it comes to body proportions. You're unable to make a dwarf, a chunky dude, make a super muscly dude, or in my case, make a realistically sized goblin. Though the game does make it very easy to make a slender and attractive supermodel. The music is also pretty good, with a nice mix of epic music, violins, and drums depending on the area you're in and what you're doing. I played through most of the game initially with the music off, but I've found myself turning it back on now and enjoying my time listening to it. Let's talk about the console experience. This game is available on PC, PS5, and Xbox, and features crossplay so you can play with your friends no matter what platform they're on. Unfortunately, your characters are attached to your Steam, PlayStation, and Xbox account rather than your Amazon Games account, meaning no cross-progression. I think that's a travesty, it's a major letdown, but I guess it just wasn't a priority for Amazon. While playing with a controller isn't half bad, playing on a console after playing on a PC first left a lot to be desired. On console, you will have loading screens. The graphics do not look as good, and stuttering was typical on the PS5. And I didn't even put the console through the same stress that my PC goes through with endgame PvP. Overall, mouse and keyboard and playing on the PC is the way to go and enjoy the game. Moving on to the movement mechanics, there are three movement morph types in Throne of Liberty. Dash, Glide, and Swim. Dash allows you to transform into a wolf, tiger, or a little bunny to sprint quicker across the land. One of my favorite mechanics is the glide morph though. Morphing in the air transforms you into a bird or other winged creature, allowing you to safely descend from heights. Using the dash morph to run past enemies, gliding, and swimming fast all consume stamina. As you collect morphs, they level up, making morphs more efficient when using stamina. The grappling hook is another fun movement mechanic, although it can only be triggered in specific locations around the map. There are quite a few puzzles and dungeon mechanics in the game, where players are required to combine gliding with the grappling hook in order to complete them. Personally, I think it's a lot of fun, though it can be janky at times. If you're hoping for an engaging main story quest, it is not here. The story itself is forgettable and completely skippable. While the voice acting is decent for a dubbed game, it is nowhere near the quality of games like World of Warcraft or Star Wars The Old Republic. Such skill. You must be very strong to fight off all those Akium soldiers on your own. However, I did appreciate the little 2D cutscenes that they play at the end of each story chapter. They were pretty nice. Hamel, the sacred deer of the Black Howe Plains, met his demise. And his death heralded Iskale's return. The narrator sounds almost identical to the narrator from Baldur's Gate 3. She recaps each quest at the end of it, so even if you skip all the dialogue, you can always listen to her to catch back up. That being said, play through the whole main story quest, because that is the most efficient way to level up and will provide you with enough gear to begin running dungeons once you hit level 50. At its core, Throne and Liberty is a tab targeting MMO, which is nothing new. However, this game was definitely designed with consoles in mind, as you can only have up to 12 abilities on your bar. This isn't like World of Warcraft, where you have dozens of abilities across multiple rows of bars. Each weapon equipped provides a selection of abilities and passives to choose from, and you can have up to 12 active abilities and 8 passive abilities equipped at once. Your weapon combination determines your class in this game. For instance, a sword and a shield, combined with a wand, makes you a Templar, a class that plays similarly to the Paladin from WoW. There are quite a few combinations available in the game, and most popular builds focus on either high single target damage, such as with the Greatsword Dagger, or being a heavy crowd hitter in large-scale PvP, such as with the Longbow Staff. 
I initially thought the game was pretty dull because I only had 12 abilities and I wanted access to the full 24, but I eventually warmed up to it and now I like having just the 12. PvP and boss fights both heavily rely on the parry system, which is a lot of fun to use. The boss fights are pretty simple in the tier 1 dungeons, but the tier 2 dungeons definitely kick up the PvE content a notch and are a lot of fun. Players have to dodge roll and parry enemy attacks, while simultaneously continuing to damage the boss and manage other boss specific mechanics. There's no doubt in my mind that this is a PvP centered MMO. The main reason to gear up in the game is to be stronger for PvP. The main forms of PvP content in the game are guild vs guild dynamic events, conflict world bosses, and of course sieges. These events can have a few hundred participants to well over a thousand depending on your server. Now, Throne of Liberty does not have predetermined PvP factions like in World of Warcraft with the Alliance and the Horde. Rather, players are free to build alliances and feuds with whoever they choose. Conflict bosses are the most common type of PvP event. They appear several times a day and transform the arena around them into an open PvP zone. Anyone who's not a member of your party, guild, or alliance is considered an enemy. These conflict bosses frequently have multiple guilds duking it out for the loot. Boss mechanics can be used as a weapon against other guilds, and this leads to some really interesting scenarios where even a stronger guild can get wiped if they aren't careful. The loot is distributed at conflict bosses to guilds depending on their entire contribution. Killing an enemy player removes 70% of that player's individual contribution, which brings down the guild's contribution for every death. A lot of players return to the zone immediately, desperately rushing back to the boss to try and damage it even more for more contribution, but they usually end up dying multiple times, resetting their entire contribution, and a lot of players don't know that. Some guilds choose to reset the boss entirely after wiping out the enemy zerg, resetting everyone's contribution. Once they have complete control of the zone, they kill the boss, stop any stragglers from coming in and getting contribution, and this allows them to secure the entire loot pool to themselves. However, Throne of Liberty does not force PvP on anyone. If you don't go to an open dungeon at night, and if you don't go to a conflict boss, then you can enjoy all the PvE content that the game has to offer. Peace bosses are also available for players looking to avoid PvP. You're able to enter a portal, kill the boss in a separate dimension, and your loot contribution is tied to you as an individual rather than to your guild. While Throne of Liberty incorporates some pay to win elements, it's not as extreme as a lot of other gotcha MMOs out there where whales have exclusive access to gear and content. Whales do have an advantage by acquiring gear faster, building wealth, and staying ahead of the curve with new content. However, free to play players can catch up over time with dedication and effort, and a lot of the top players on the game are free to play users that are able to sell stuff on the auction house to gear up. The game's gear system revolves around traits, which significantly impact gameplay. Traits can be upgraded by fusing and enhancing gear with gear extracts, obtained through farming, or you can buy them through the auction house. Whales like to swipe and shortcut the grind by purchasing the extracts with real-world money off of the auction house, but free-to-play players can sell their own gear or traits to fund upgrades. This system creates a really grind-heavy loop that does reward persistence but definitely tempts players to pay for convenience, which I have definitely done. PvP requires good gear and skill, but even paying players need to join strong guilds and strategize if they want to dominate in events like Boonstone battles and castle sieges. Gear alone does not make you unbeatable. Building your character correctly, running the right setup, being mechanically better at the game, and of course having better gameplay knowledge are all still indispensable. Also, once a whale has capped out, that's it, they've capped out. Free-to-play players are also able to cap out, and once they reach that cap, they're on the same footing as the whales. Whales can't just infinitely swipe to get stronger and stronger. The auction house is unlocked at level 40, and is definitely the most controversial feature in the game because it allows real money currency to buy gear and traits directly from the auction house, allowing whales to skip the grind. While this definitely appears to be pay to win, it provides an opportunity for free-to-play players to earn currency by selling valuable gear and extracts on the auction house, which a lot of players do. Progress for free-to-play players may be slower, but it's achievable with time and effort. For those concerned about impulse spending though, it is definitely tempting and it can be a real money pit if you decide to go and buy items off of the auction house. All things considered, Throne and Liberty is a graphically gorgeous MMO with entertaining movement mechanics and combat systems, with a heavy emphasis on guild versus guild and alliance versus alliance PvP. Pay to win elements do exist, but they don't make the whales unkillable and there aren't any hard paywalls that completely stop free to play users from progressing. Whales get ahead faster, 
but smart planning and persistence can lead to free-to-play guilds actually dominating in both PvE and PvP. If you're looking for a new MMO and don't mind the grind, Throne of Liberty is worth exploring. There is plenty of PvE content to play through and you'll be able to get well over 100 hours out of the game without ever spending a penny as long as you don't want to be in the top 1%. Thanks for watching and please don't forget to like the video and subscribe for more reviews.